What's up science fam? Last video we talked about the hydrosphere and the water cycle. In this next video, we're going to talk about all the other three spheres and how they relate to each other. My name is Sermon and this is Science with Sermon and let's get right into it. So what sphere envelops the entire planet? So the entire planet is covered in a layer of gases, so it's the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is basically the gases that surround the planet and is held in place by its gravity and our atmosphere in the Earth is made up mostly of nitrogen gas. 78% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen, and then less than 1% of all the other gases. But sir, what about greenhouse gases? Yes, they are still less than 1% of the atmosphere, but even if they're less than 1%, they do still contribute a significant greenhouse effect. So now we can move on. What are the layers of the atmosphere? How are they different from each other? These are the different layers of the atmosphere and we'll go through them one by one. First things first, what sets the layers apart? What are the boundaries between these layers in the atmosphere? We have the temperature gradients. So the temperature gradients are the trends of how temperature changes between the layers. So between layers, we have pause layers. So that's when the temperature generally doesn't change as you go higher or away from the Earth's surface. Now, if you notice, in the lowest layer, uh, the temperature changes so that it becomes colder as you go up. And then in the next layer, it becomes hotter as you go up. And it changes so that it goes uh, colder, hotter, colder, hotter. And that's what makes them different layers of the atmosphere. Now let's go discuss the first one. The lowest and densest layer is the troposphere, and that's the layer we're in. So the troposphere is also where most weather conditions occur. All your tornadoes and storms, that's where they are. And generally, the temperature gets colder. It decreases as you go higher. That's why in high altitudes, your temperature becomes very, very low. The tropopause is the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere. So this is where it starts to change properties. So in the stratosphere, the second layer from the surface, that's where your airliners and jet planes tend to cruise. Because in the lower stratosphere, there's no weather, but also um, it's not too difficult to climb to that altitude. So in the stratosphere as well, your temperature increases as you go higher because of a special layer. So the ozone layer is where... Uh, the stratosphere is where the ozone layer is, and because of the function of ozone, it traps heat in that layer. So the ozone layer is a layer of ozone gas, or O3. It absorbs harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So it protects us, and by protecting us, the heat or the energy from the ultraviolet radiation gets trapped in the stratosphere. That's why it gets hotter as you go higher in the stratosphere. Next is the mesosphere. It's the third layer from the surface and it's where meteors tend to burn up. So your meteor showers generally are um, visible due to how they burn up in the mesosphere. They burn up there because there's just enough uh, air molecules for the uh, meteors to build up friction and heat. So your temperature in the mesosphere, even though your meteors burn up due to the friction and the heat, your temperature here decreases as you go higher because there's no longer any ozone layer there and it loses energy as you go higher because there's less molecules that can trap the energy, right? So that's the mesosphere. Next, we have the thermosphere. It's the fourth layer from the surface. It's called the thermosphere because it's very hot there. So the thermosphere contains most of the ionosphere. Ionosphere is another layer which corresponds, uh, which is between the mesosphere and the exosphere. So again, most of it is in the thermosphere. The ionosphere has charged ions. Again, charged ions, so it's positive or negative, that stay there in the atmosphere. And the ionosphere is very significant because the radio stations that we have on the surface can transmit the radio waves, their radio signals to the ionosphere where it can be deflected by the ionosphere and be bounced back so that there is a higher coverage area for our radio broadcasting systems. Your ionosphere is also why we have aurora formations in the night sky in the upper northern and lower southern hemispheres. So the altitude of orbit of the International Space Station is also in the thermosphere layer. And also the thermosphere, the temperature increases as you go higher because there is more solar radiation exposure as you get farther away from the surface of the Earth. And finally, we have the exosphere. It's the fifth layer from the surface. So it's basically the layer where molecules, air molecules can escape 
Earth's gravity. There's so few air molecules in the exosphere that even though the temperature there is technically very high in the thousands of degrees Celsius, you will still feel cold there because there's very few, very rare air molecules to actually make you feel that temperature. Okay, again, exosphere, the last layer of the atmosphere. Moving on, which sphere has the most mass? What contributes the most to the Earth by mass? It's the geosphere, the solid parts of the Earth. And in the background, we can see different layers of the Earth. So the geosphere corresponds to the layers of the Earth, which we actually discussed last year in grade 10. But for the benefit of everyone's uh, memory and refresher, let's describe the structure of the Earth or the layers of the Earth. So again, Earth's layers can be described in two main ways, the compositional and the structural. Composition is based on what it's made of, structural is based on the physical characteristics. So when we say compositional, the first things first, in the outer layer we have the crust. So it's a thin solid shell, if we think of the earth as an egg, it's the egg shell. We have dense oceanic crust and less dense continental crust. On the other side, if we describe it as a structural form, we have the lithosphere. So the lithosphere, based on its properties, is the rigid part, the rigid outer layer. So it's the rigid crust plus the upper mantle that functions like an elastic solid. So since it functions like an elastic solid, it's more rigid and solid than the lower mantle, it's called the lithosphere. All right, next, just beneath the surface, in the compositional description, we have the mantle. So you can see here, it says, consists of ultramafic silicates. Anyway, so the mantle is significantly less dense than the crust, and it acts sort of like a viscous fluid over a period of geological time. But again, the mantle, in this case, in the compositional description, it's mostly about the composition. This is just a uh, general description. Okay? More of the general description of the, uh, more, uh, more specific description of the actual physical characteristics are in the structural layers of the earth we have the asthenosphere which is partially molten and plastic plastic meaning it flows even though it's solid the lower mantle on the other hand is more rigid than the asthenosphere so even though it's lower it's more rigid and doesn't flow as much so the asthenosphere the upper mantle it flows a bit the lower mantle is more rigid so the deepest parts we have the core Whoops, I moved the wrong thing. I wanted to move my face. The core is the center of the earth. It consists of magnetic metals. So crust, mantle, then core. That's for the compositional description of the earth's layers. But if we go to the structural composition, the core is divided into two. The outer core, which is liquid, and the inner core, which is solid. Now, because the solid inner core is magnetic, and so is the liquid outer core, which spins around the inner core, we have an electromagnetic system. Just like a solid nail, solid iron nail with wire, with electricity uh, flowing through the wire, it becomes an electromagnet. The Earth is a giant electromagnet, and that gives us our electromagnetic field, which protects us from radiation such as solar radiation. And finally, we have the biosphere. It's all of the living things on Earth. Again, emphasis on living things. In Earth system science, when we talk about Earth systems, the biosphere is just talking about the living things. The things that living things make or living things affect will not be part of the biosphere in terms of Earth science. Now, the question in the biosphere is this. So living things can change the face of the Earth, but will it be for the worse or will it be for the better? Can we, as living things, part of the Earth system, part of the biosphere, can we steer the world towards a world of balance and harmony? Or are we just here to harm it? So for those of you that are religious, you know, different religions say that we, people, are stewards. As sentient beings, we're supposed to care for our home, our habitat. And yet, what are we doing? So I leave you with that. Hopefully you have some of that to, uh, you, you think about that, you contemplate about that, and you exert yourself in order to become a change for the better, become a good part of the biosphere and bring things into balance. All right, so I'll see you guys in the next lecture videos.